Hello YouTube, in this video I'm going to introduce the semantic conception of truth proposed by Alfred Tarski. Now Tarski was primarily a mathematician, uh, he saw an important role for the concept of truth in mathematics and formal logic, and, and his goal was to define truth uh, for these disciplines. Uh, so to, he's to, to define truth in the context of uh, formal logical languages, not natural languages such as English. Nevertheless, his work was very influential on philosophers working on truth. Uh, I don't think it would be too much of an exaggeration to say that uh, work on truth in the 20th century was a series of footnotes to Tarski. Um, but uh, his work is also pretty technical. I'm going to provide a summary of the relevant philosophical points. Um, to be clear, you know, I'm simplifying things here. I'm, I'm going to try to communicate the important points in a way that should hopefully be accessible to a broad audience. So, <clears throat> what exactly is a definition of truth supposed to do? What are we trying to achieve when we give a definition of truth? Well, for Tarski, any acceptable definition of truth must meet two conditions. These are the conditions of what he calls material adequacy and formal correctness. So let's start with the material adequacy condition. A uh, theory of truth must be materially adequate. So the point here, I mean the motivation for this, is that a definition of truth needs to capture the actual meaning of the word true, right? We're not just stipulating some new technical notion, we're trying to elaborate a concept that all of us already understand. Um, Tarski approvingly cites Aristotle as neatly summarising this ordinary use. So Aristotle says, to say of what is that it is, or of what is not that it is not, is true. It is so that snow is white, so it is true to say that snow is white. Um, it is not so that snow is black, so it's not true to say that snow is black. Um, now, of course, this in itself isn't a, isn't a satisfactory definition, and it's rather open to interpretation. Um, but we want a definition of truth that does justice to this sort of idea. Um, if we're not doing justice to this sort of idea, then we're just not talking about truth. Um, you might immediately notice that this is uh, perhaps uh, reminiscent of the correspondence theory of truth. Um, and uh, that would be right. Tarski is quite explicit that, um, you know, he's he sees himself as offering something like a kind of correspondence theory of truth, although uh, other people have interpreted Tarski as really giving a kind of deflationary theory of truth. We will talk about deflationism in a later video. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as Tarski is concerned, this is kind of in the, the tradition of, of correspondence theory. Um, okay, so, you know, we have this sort of Aristotelian intuition uh, about, about the notion of truth. And then Tarski tries to give a more precise statement of this uh, Aristotelian idea. And this is the material adequacy condition. So the material adequacy condition says that our definition of truth must entail all instances of uh, sentences of the following form. Um, so these are sentences of the form T, where the sentences of the form P is true if and only if P. Uh, now, in this case, the uh, the second P is replaced by a sentence of the language. The first P is replaced by the name of that sentence. Um, so this is fairly straightforward, right? So we have, for instance, um, snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. That's an instance of T. Um, and these are called T sentences. Instances of T are called T sentences. So again, on, on the right-hand side, we have the sentence, snow is white. On the left-hand side, we have the name of that sentence, and we obtain the name of that sentence by placing the sentence in quotation marks. So when, when we say snow is white and we put quotation marks around it, that is the name of the sentence, snow is white. And we could name it anything. You know, we could just as well name the sentence Frank. And then we would say, Frank is true if and only if snow is white. So yeah, left-hand side is the name of the sentence, and on the right-hand side, we use the sentence. And the claim is that a definition of truth is materially, ad materially adequate if all of these uh, equivalences follow from it. Um, so, I mean, we can kind of think of this as... So th 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 this, um, uh, th th this is involving a pair of rules, right? So, P is true if and only if P. Um, basically, we're saying, if P is true, then P... And if P, then P is true, right? So if snow is white is true, then snow is white. 
and if snow is white, then snow is white is true. So if you assert that, basically like, look, if I, if I say that snow is white is true, then I can just infer that snow is white, right? Like it follows from snow is white is true, that oh, snow is white. Um, and if I assert that snow is white, then I can infer that snow is white is true. Um, now, it's important to notice that T is not itself a definition of truth. What it, what it tells us is the extension of the term true. Um, it, it's two different definitions could entail all instances of T. So T is not itself a definition. Um, but what we're saying is, is any acceptable definition needs to entail all of the instances of T. Okay. Second condition on an adequate theory of truth is formal correctness. Now, essentially, this is just the idea that there should be no logical errors in the definition. In particular, the definition must not lead to contradiction. Now, this point, <clears throat> this point is particularly important because there are various logical paradoxes associated with truth. Uh, suppose that we have a language in which there are the standard logical laws, so the, the laws of classical logic, and uh, the language is semantically closed. So a language is semantically closed just uh, in case, first of all, it is capable of self-reference, so it contains expressions that can refer to its own expressions. So think about an expression such as this sentence, like this sentence contains five words, or this sentence gave birth to an elephant, right, whatever. Like th so with the expression this sentence, I can, like I'm referring to the sentence that I'm saying. <laughs> um, so this is this is self-reference, right? And, and similarly, like in English, we have all sorts of terms that we can use to refer to sentences of English. Um, so English kind of has this capacity for self-reference. Um, then secondly, the language contains predicates such as true and false. Um, so, so, so a language is semantically closed just in case it's capable of self-reference and it contains predicates like true and false. Now, if a language is semantically closed, if it's, if it's capable of self-reference and it has a truth predicate, then we can construct a liar sentence. So, the liar sentence. This sentence is false. And this leads to a contradiction. Um, so, let's take the, so, take the sentence, this sentence is false. Well, is that true or false? If you take the sentence to be true, well, in that case, it correctly ascribes falsity to itself, in which case it must be false, right? So if we take this sentence is false to be true, then it's correctly describing itself as false and therefore it's false. Um, so from the assumption that it's true, it follows that it's false. On the other hand, if you take the sentence to be false, well, it, it has the property that it ascribes to itself because it's saying that it's false. So if you take it to be false, then it correctly describes itself as false, so therefore it's true. So from the assumption that it's false, you can derive that it's true. So whether we assign true or false to this sentence, it turns out to be both true and false. We end up with a, a straightforward contradiction. Um, and so Tarski wants to give a definition of truth that avoids these sorts of logical paradoxes. It avoids this, this logical contradiction. Um, now, Tarski is not prepared to modify the laws of logic. So, you know, one way you might try to get out of something like the liar paradox is, is to, you know, maybe you can claim, well, the sentence is neither true nor false, or, you know, um, it, it's, uh, you know, maybe you might try to deny the inferences that allow us to derive the contradiction, or maybe you're just prepared to accept the contradiction, um, as the dialetheists do. Um, but th this would require modifying the laws of logic. Tarski uh, isn't willing to do that. So uh, instead, a formally correct definition of truth, a definition that is not inconsistent, can only be given in a language that is not semantically closed. The language must be semantically open. Um, so as, as I noted, Tarski is not dealing with natural languages here because natural languages are plausibly interpreted, at least, as semantically closed. I mean, English can refer to its own expressions and it has a truth predicate. So, you know, um, I mean, obviously, English isn't isn't a formal language, so its logical properties are vague. Um, but, you know, uh, at least prima facie, it looks like, OK, English probably semantically closed. So um, 
Yeah, in any case, Tarski is clear that a definition of truth for English just can't be provided. So here's what he says. Uh, the problem of the definition of truth obtains a precise meaning and can be solved in a rigorous way only for those languages whose structure has been exactly specified. For other languages, thus for all natural spoken languages, the meaning of the problem is more or less vague and its solution can have only an approximate character. Roughly speaking, the approximation consists in replacing a natural language by one whose structure is exactly specified and which diverges from the given language as little as possible. So, um, I, I mean, so Tarski's, again, you know, quite explicit, right? Like, we, the, the way that you go about giving a definition of truth um, is you're going to have to specify, you're going to have to construct an artificial language, a more formal language, which is not semantically closed. Um, and, and so, you know, when it comes to, like, natural languages, if you, if you sort of say, well, you know, what's, like, the, the meaning of truth in English? There just isn't any clear answer to that. Um, you know, the only way that we can really give a an acceptable definition of truth is to construct a new language, right? English is vague and messy and maybe incoherent, right? So, uh, you know, we have to we have to replace it. We have to replace it with uh, a formal ideal language. Um, and of course, hopefully, the language we replace it with should be as similar as possible to English while removing the problems that, you know, lead, uh, that, that lead to things like the liar sentence. Um, okay, so we need to specify a language which is not semantically closed. Now, since we're explicitly giving a definition of truth, we can't avoid having a truth predicate, so that leaves self-referentiality. We need to eliminate self-referentiality from the language. Okay, then, just a quick advert. Um, if you like my channel, you can support me on Patreon, where I upload bonus videos. Um, also, PayPal, if you want to give a one-off donation. Anything helps. You know, th these videos, they take a lot of time. They do take a lot of, uh, of effort. And uh, I, I'm not a wealthy person. So, you know, if you, if you like what I'm doing and you want to support the channel, I, I really appreciate it. And anything you can throw my way, you know, it really helps. So... Um, there's that. Also, I do offer private tutoring in philosophy. Send an email if you're interested. Um, I have a PhD in this subject, so I am qualified. And join the Discord if you want. Links to all of this will be in the description. All right, then. With that said, let's let's move, move on with Tarski. So we need to, uh, as I said, we, we want to specify a language which is not semantically closed. Now, in order to do this, so Tarski says that if we want to give a definition of truth, the trick is we have to use two different languages. And so to this end, he distinguishes what he calls the object language from the meta language. Okay, so, so the thought is this, right? In order to avoid semantic closure, our language cannot attribute truth or falsehood to its own expressions. So talk of truth requires like the construction of these two languages where we have the object language, which is the language we are talking about, and the meta language, which is the language we are using to talk about the object language. So the definition of truth is given in the meta language and applies to sentences of the object language, right? So we give a definition of truth in the object language where we use a different language, we use the meta language, and the meta language is a language that has the expressive power to refer to sentences in the object language. We don't give, like, a, so that there isn't a definition of truth just in general. There's a definition of truth in the object language. Um, okay, so recall the, these instances of T, right? P is true if and only if P. So the, the idea is that the left-hand side, P, names a sentence of the object language. Now, T itself, the sentence P is true if and only if P, that is a sentence of the meta-language. And indeed, I mean, on Tarski's view, strictly speaking, this way of stating T is meaningless. And this is because truth has to be relativized to the object language. So when we say P is true if and only if P, we have to interpret this as basically abbreviating P is true in the object language, um, if and only if P. Um, so, so true abbreviates true in the object language, false abbreviates false in the object language. 
I guess it's, it's easiest to see what's going on here if we consider two different um, natural languages. So let's say um, we have the following T sentence. Schneest Weiss is true in German if and only if snow is white. Um, now clearly this T sentence is a sentence in English. English is the meta language, German is the object language. We're using English to talk about the truth value of particular German sentences. Um, so we have the name of a German sentence on the left and the English translation on the right. You know, so similarly I could say something like the German sentence Schneest Weiss means that snow is white. So that's an English sentence. Schneest Weiss is in quotation marks. That functions as the name for the German sentence. German is the object language. English is the meta language. Um, and again, notice that strictly speaking here, there isn't really, when I say Schneest Weiss is true in German if and only if snow is white, there isn't really any German here at all because Schneest Weiss in quotation marks is a name in the English meta language for a German sentence. Again, I could name it something else. I could name it Frank. And then I'd say Frank is true in German if and only if snow is white. But um, it's, it's, you know, easier to understand what's being said if I say Schneest Weiss and enclose it in quotation marks. Um, okay then, so, the, you know, the, the material, the material adequacy condition, as we've seen, this requires that all true equivalences of the form T must be implied by a correct definition of truth. So the meta language must be able to refer to all sentences of the object language. Um, and you can do this very easily uh, in English. You, you know, when we, so if we take German as the object, object language, we can just stipulate a name for every German sentence. And enclosing the German sentences in quotation marks is an easy way of generating a name for every one of them. But of course, we need not use English and German. Uh, we could use English as both the object language and the meta language. So we'd say like, snow is white is true in English if and only if snow is white. Um, where, where the first snow is white is a sentence of the object language. And then when I say snow is white is true in English if and only if snow is white, that's a sentence of the meta language. It's talking about the object language sentence. But of course, you know, so neither if i say snow is white is true in english if and only if snow is white then really strictly speaking um neither the object language nor the meta language here if they are to do the work that tarski requires are going to be ordinary natural language english we're dealing with two different language two different languages which are each a kind of formalized version of english um, again in order to avoid the liar paradox we can't allow the language in which we're giving a definition of truth to have the, the power of self-reference. If a language can be used as its own meta-language, then it will have a truth predicate, it will have the capacity for self-reference, and so it will be able to generate the liar paradox. So when we use the meta-language to talk about truth in the object language, these have to be two different languages. But they are two different languages that they might both look very much like natural language English. Okay, so one way to think about this is in terms of a sort of hierarchy of languages, in terms of like levels. Um, when I say, if I just say snow is white, I'm at level zero. I'm just making a claim about the world. Then when I say snow is white is true, I'm going up a level. I'm talking about a level zero sentence using a level one sentence. And level one is a different language, right? In this case, level zero is the object language and level one is the meta language. But of course, we also wanna say that some sentences are true or false in the level one meta language. So snow is white is true. Well, that is itself true. How do we make sense of this? Well, again, we just go up a level. So snow is white is true is true. <laughs> that is a level two sentence. Um, and then in this case, level one is the object language and level two is the meta language. Remember, the object language is just whatever language we're talking about. The meta language is whatever language we use to talk about the object language. So if we want to talk about truth in the meta language, then, you know, what we're initially using is the meta language will become the object language. Um, and, and, you know, on it goes. We have, we have this infinite hierarchy of formal languages. Sentences uh, can only predicate truth or falsity of sentences of a lower level than themselves. So here's a little diagram, right? Level zero, snow is white, and then we, you know, we go up, okay? Snow is white is true in the level zero language, and then you go up. Snow is white is true, is true in the level 
uh, level one language, etc. Um, so, yeah, on Tarski's conception, there is, strictly speaking, no such thing as truth in general. There's true in level zero, true in level one, true in etc. The concept of truth is relativized to a language. Um, the same sentence, the same sequence of marks might be true in one language, but false in another. And that is, I suppose, a fairly natural consequence, uh, because different languages might assign different meanings to the same inscriptions. So think about a language that is just like English, except that the meaning of white and blue is switched. Uh, when we see white things, we call them white, but when speakers of uh, Smenglish see white things, they call them blue. So if we take English as our object language, then we had snow is white is true in English, if and only if snow is white. If we take Smenglish as our object language, we will get the T sentence, snow is white is true in Smenglish, if and only if snow is blue. Um, and of course, snow is white is not true in Smenglish, uh, because snow isn't blue. Um, but of course, we can't, so we can't assess the truth value of the sentence, snow is white, sort of independent of any language. Okay. So we've seen then how to construct semantically open languages. We've seen how to construct a, a hierarchy of semantically open languages. Now, recall that the motivation for all of this was to avoid the liar paradox. How does all of this help? So the liar sentence was, this sentence is false. What does that mean? Well, on Tarski's account, this has to be interpreted as a sentence of the meta language, which is saying this sentence is false in the object language. So the object language is O, right? This sentence is false in O. Um, we'll call it F star, right? F star is false in O. But F star doesn't appear in the object language. F star can't be stated in the object language. F star is a sentence of the meta language because, you know, true in the object language and false in the object language are meta language concepts. Um, in which case, the paradox is straightforwardly resolved. Uh, F star does not exist in the object language, so F star isn't false in the object language. Um, so F star is simply false. There's no contradiction here. We can't derive that F star is both true and false. It's just false. So when I say F star is false in the object language, that's just false. Um, now, in, in saying that F star is false, I'm ascending up a level. So we have, you know, so we have the object language, right? We have O, the object language, and there's just no sentence. There is no F star here, okay? Then, you know, level one, the meta language, we have the sentence F star is false in O, right? But, um, I mean, that's that's false. Uh, that's not true. That's an incorrect description of O. Um, so uh, we, we want to say that this is false then. So F star is false in O. We want to say that that's false. So we're saying F star is false in O is false in L1. Um, and in saying this, we've ascended to level two. Uh, the reason why F star is false in L1 is because in L1, it purports to name a sentence in O, but of course there is no such sentence. Um, uh, now, this sentence in L2, right, so the F star is false in O is false in L1, that's a sentence of L2, and that's true, and we can express that by ascending to level 3, and so on. So, the liar paradox arises from how the sentence attributes falsity to itself, but by distinguishing the object language and the meta language, Tarski prevents any sentence from attributing truth or falsity to itself. Okay. We have uh, two conditions on a definition of truth, material adequacy and formal correctness. Um, and we have a rather neat solution to the liar paradox. But we don't yet have a definition of truth. Um, you know, we have conditions for an adequate definition of truth, and we're sort of beginning perhaps to see the form that this might take. Um, but we don't have a definition of truth yet. So what exactly is Tarski's definition of truth? So. First of all, then, it's let's begin with a kind of toy language. We'll begin with a finite language. So one of the things <coughs> Tarski says is that we can think of a T sentence as being a partial definition of truth. A T sentence tells us the truth conditions of 
one sentence. So a t-sentence is a definition of truth for that specific sentence. All right, so snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. This defines the word truth with respect to the sentence snow is white. So that's a partial definition of truth. But then all t-sentences for every sentence of the object language would be a complete definition of truth for the object language. So in principle, giving a definition of truth is very simple. We just list all the t-sentences of the object language. Um, and that would be a complete definition of truth for the object language. Now, unfortunately, okay, simple in principle, unfortunately, the number of sentences in a language may be infinite. So we can't actually list all the t-sentences. So that approach doesn't work in practice. Um, we can't write down a definition of truth that is infinitely long. Um, what we would need to do is show how to derive the t-sentences from a finite number of axioms. Um, that would you know, that would allow us to state the definition of truth in terms of those axioms. But I mean, so just to be clear how, you know, so, you know, like, let's, let's see how this works for a finite language, though, right? Like, you know, we can, we can construct a finite language. Um, so here's a very simple finite language. It's a language containing only two sentences. Snow is white, and grass is green. There's nothing else in this language. It doesn't contain any mechanism for generating new sentences just snow is white and grass is green and that's that. Well we can easily give a complete definition of truth for this language. Here it is. Snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. Grass is green is true if and only if grass is green. Um, so you know we could I guess put the, the sort of abstract definition like this. Um, uh, P is true in L if and only if P equals snow is white and snow is white or P equals grass is green and grass is green. There you go. That is the complete definition of truth for this simple language. It's material adequate. It's formally correct. It meets Tarski's. Um, it meets Tarski's true conditions. You know, we're stating it in the meta language, so you know, we, we don't. We don't. We're not able to construct liars and all of this. This is. This is it. There you go. That's the complete definition of truth for this simple language. So this kind of gives us a. You know, again, this doesn't work for um, any language that is um, infinite, right? that can contain infinite numbers of sentences. But it sort of gives us a little toy model of how this is going to work and, um, you know, of just how simple and straightforward, in a way, Tarski's approach is. OK, so we want to uh, extend this idea to a language that contains an infinite number of sentences. Provided the language has the right structure, truth can be defined uh, using recursion. So, suppose we add to our simple language the connectives and and not. Um, so we, we now have sentences like, we you know, we, we begin with the sentence snow is white, but then we can say things like snow is not white. Um, or we can say snow is white and grass is green. Or snow is white and snow is white and grass is green. Snow is not white, and snow is white, and snow is white, and grass is green. This is not uh, a language with much expressive power, obviously, but uh, we can construct an infinite number of sentences this way. There are an infinite number of grammatical sentences in this language, and you can just do that by, you know, endlessly uh, adding things to a conjunction. Uh, you know, snow is white, and snow is white, and snow is white, just do that endlessly. Um, so we have a language with an infinite number of sentences. Now, how do we define truth in this language? Well, to do this, we need the, so the base clauses and the recursion clauses. So the base clauses are the same as before. Snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. Grass is green is true if and only if grass is green. OK, those are the base clauses. Then we have the recursion clauses. So for any sentences, A or B, a and B is true if and only if A is true and B is true. Not A is true if and only if it is not the case that A is true. And if you put all this together, we get the definition. P is true in L if and only if P equals snow is white and snow is white, or P equals grass is green and grass is green, or P equals A and B and A is true and B is true or P equals not A, and it is not the case that A is true. Um, 
And this, again, this is a complete definition of truth for the language. It's material adequate and formally correct. Now, what we have here, we, we don't have a list of all of the T sentences for the language. That list would be infinite. But this definition entails all of the T sentences because for any grammatical combination of terms in this language, this truth definition will entail the, the T sentence. So, you know, snow is white and grass is green is true if and only if snow is white and grass is green. Well, we know that A and B is true just in case A is true and B is true. And we have it that snow is white is true if and only if snow is white and grass is green is true if and only if grass is green. So snow is white and grass is green is true if and only if snow is white and grass is green, right? Um, and so using this this, 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 uh, you know, the, the base clauses and the recursion clauses, using this definition, we can get all of the T sentences for our simple language. Um, and, you know, all of this, I suppose, is, I mean, it's, it's fairly simple. It's trivial, really. Um, and of course, this isn't a particularly useful language. Um, all of the sentences are either basic sentences or they're constructed from basic sentences using logical connectives. Um, so let's turn to a slightly more complex language. Um, in more complex languages, one of the things we can do is create sentences by combining expressions that are not themselves sentences. So in particular, in more complex languages, uh, we, have, we have sort of expressions that um, can be analysed as uh, open sentences, and for this we can use the notion of satisfaction to um, to define truth. So um, let's explain what's going on here. Uh, in an open sentence, well, an open sentence is just like a, a normal sentence, except that it has a free variable in one or more of the places where a sentence would have a noun. For example, X is white, uh, X is green, X is north of Y. X is between Y and Z. These sentences are not true or false, uh, obviously. Um, X is white, right? Well, X, you plug anything into, into there, right? Um, so X is white is not itself true or false. Rather, we would say that they are satisfied or not satisfied by various things. So X is white is satisfied by snow because snow is white, right? Uh, X is green is satisfied by grass. So X is white is satisfied by all of the white things. Um, X is green is satisfied by all of the green things. Um, those are the simple open sentences, but then there are the more complex ones. So X is north of Y. That is satisfied by the ordered pair London, Rome. Um, the ordered pair London, Rome is different from the ordered pair Rome, London. Um, the ordered pair Rome, London does not satisfy X is north of Y. Uh, in ordered pairs, the order matters. That's why it's called an ordered pair. Um, so, yeah, the X is north of Y, that's satisfied by the ordered pair London, Rome. Um, so, I mean, look, open sentences basically express properties and relations. OK, so, you know, X is Y, X is north of Y. These are properties and relations. And this is, you know, again, you know, complex languages, uh, have this sort of power. Um, you know, we can take the same property and attribute it to all sorts of different things. Snow is white, my cup is white, the clouds are white, etc. Um, so X is white is satisfied by many different things. Okay, satisfaction then is a relation between open sentences and ordered sequences of objects. Now, for technical reasons, Tarski says that uh, X is white, and these other open sentences are satisfied. Um, we have to be thinking of infinite sequences of objects because, um, you know, you you could uh, you you could have essentially a sentence where you have you know uh, any number of relations. You know, so we have X is north of Y. There you have X and Y. You have X is between Y and Z. Well, in that case, you've got three places. So we need to think of infinite sequences of objects. So for, te for technical reasons, uh, X is white is satisfied by any sequence of objects where the first object in that sequence is white. And then we can just ignore the rest of the sequence. So X is white is satisfied by the sequence 
snow, grass, the Andromeda galaxy, Kane's left hand, and then you just lift, list every other object, right? But it, it doesn't matter. The first object in that sequence is snow, uh, that is white, and that satisfies X is white. And we just ignore the sequence beyond the first object. Similarly, X is north of Y, that's satisfied by any sequence of objects in which the first object in the sequence is north of the second object in the sequence. So any sequence of objects which begins London, Rome, blah, 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 right? London, Rome, snow, grass, Edinburgh, the internet, the Andromeda galaxy, Kane's left hand, that infinite sequence of objects satisfies X is north of Y because we have X and Y, so we just take the first two objects in that sequence. Okay, this might sound kind of technical and perhaps a bit weird, but I mean, the central idea here is really very simple, okay? We're basically saying, look, X is white is satisfied by snow. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the predicate white is true of snow. I correctly describe the property of snow when I predicate whiteness of it. That's, that's what it means to say that X is white is satisfied by snow. And, and so notice the important relation between satisfaction and truth. One way to think of satisfaction is that it's, a, it's like a tool for turning open sentences into true sentences. The open sentence X is white is satisfied by snow. So what you, what you then get is snow is white, a true sentence. You plug snow into the X and you get a true sentence. Okay, now, um, what's the, the sort of point of all of this? Well, the key thing to notice is that a language will contain finitely many basic predicates. In English, we have predicates like X is white, X is green, X is courageous, X is necessary, X is north of Y, X loves Y, X is the father of Y, and so on. This is a very long list, but it is finite. Um, you can take the dictionary, right? And uh, eventually you're going to exhaust the list of, the list of words. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we can finitely specify all of these basic words, these basic predicates. Once we have a list of basic predicates, we can then use recursion to generate infinitely many more complex predicates. The table satisfies X is brown. It also satisfies X is rectangular, in which case the table satisfies X is brown and rectangular. So something satisfies X is brown and rectangular just in case it satisfies X is brown and X is rectangular. So if X satisfies X is F, so rather, if, if, if an object satisfies X is F and the object satisfies X is G, then the object satisfies X is F and G. Um, from X is F and X is G, we get the more complex predicate X is F and G. Similarly, the table satisfies X is not white because it fails to satisfy X is white. So if an object fails to satisfy X is F, then the object satisfies X is not F. All right, so by using these recursion clauses, we can define satisfaction for any arbitrarily complex predicates that can be formed in the language. All we need is the list of basic predicates, like X is F, X is G, and then certain logical connectives, such as and and not. So, you know, think about what we have here on the table. We have a finite list of basic predicates. Um, you know, X is white. When an object satisfies X is white, it transforms it into a true sentence. Right? Snow is white is true. Snow satisfies the predicate X is white. Then we can use a recursive definition to understand satisfaction for an infinite number of arbitrarily complex sentences. Snow is white and cold is true, right? I mean, so X is white, X is cold. Snow satisfies X is white and X is cold. So snow satisfies X is white and cold. Um, all right then, with all of this said, we can now state Tarski's definition of truth. And here's what it is. So Tarski says, hence we arrive at a definition of truth and falsehood simply by saying that a sentence is true if it is satisfied by all objects and false otherwise. So there you have it. There is Tarski's definition of truth. P is true if and only if P is satisfied by all sequences of objects. Now that might sound a little bit weird at first, <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, the way to sort of make this intuitive is um, to think about like, okay, so let's say that we, you know, obviously, so tr truth 
um, does not apply to open sentences, as we have seen. Um, but we're sort of using satisfaction to define truth. So, so start with an open sentence, right? Let's start with an open sentence with three free variables. X is between Y and Z. Well, that's satisfied by all sequences that begin London, Edinburgh, Rome, regardless of what comes out, what comes uh, after uh, in the sequence. Um, and there are other sequences that satisfy that as well. Um, but, you know, uh, Ed London, Edinburgh, Rome, that sequence, regardless of what comes after, that satisfies X is between Y and Z. OK, now a sentence with two free variables. X is larger than Y. That is satisfied by all of the sequences that begin Jupiter, Mars, etc. Um, again, doesn't matter what else comes after in the sequence. All of those sequences satisfy X is larger than Y. The sequence is one free variable. X is white. That's satisfied by all sequences that begin with snow, regardless of what else is in the sequence. OK, so finally, then we take a sentence with no free variables like snow is white. Um, this is a true sentence. Well, that's satisfied by just any sequence. Doesn't matter how it begins. Um, regardless of what objects appear, what their order is, right? Any sequence uh, satisfies the true sentence, snow is white. So when, when you have zero, so like the, the thought is, well, you know, when you have these, when you have three free variables, that's going to be satisfied by some sequences that begin with three objects, two free variables is satisfied by some sequences that begin with uh, two objects. When you have a true sentence um, that has no free variables, that's satisfied by just all of the sequences. Um, similarly, let's, let's take falsehood, right? So if we have a sentence with two free variables, x is smaller than y, that is not satisfied by any sequence that begins Jupiter, Mars, regardless of what comes next, okay? Because if you were to plug Jupiter into X and Mars into Y, you would end up with a false sentence. Um, X is smaller than Y, that's not satisfied by any sequence that begins Jupiter, Mars. Uh, a sentence with one free variable, X is black, that is not satisfied by any sequence that begins with snow. Finally, let's take a sentence with no free variables, snow is black. This false sentence fails to be satisfied by all sequences. Um, so that's it. That's Tarski's semantic definition of truth. A sentence is true just in case the sentence is satisfied by all sequences of objects. And um, and as we've seen, you know, the sort of, I suppose that, you know, the, the kind of philosophically important points here are, you know, these ideas of material adequacy, of formal correctness, the solution to the liar paradox. Um, you know, this has been this has been very influential. Uh, hopefully uh, that was interesting. Uh, that is all I'm going to talk about today. And in the next video, we will look at deflationism. OK, goodbye, everybody.